ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Tom Gleeson is here today, host of ABC TV's Hard Quiz and International Man of Mystery. This much is known. Rocketed to Earth as a small child, Tom Gleeson grew up with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Using his superpowers for penetrating satirical insight, Tom Gleeson won the highest honour that can be bestowed on a living human being, TV Week's coveted gold Logie. But the path to gold Logiedom hasn't always been smooth for Tom. For years, he struggled in a prog rock group that never quite got the recognition it deserved. But he put those bitter years of struggle behind him when stand-up comedy came along and saved his life. Hello, Tom, and welcome. Oh, g'day. Thanks for having me. You're a country boy growing up in Tambar in New South Wales. Beyond the stump. Beyond the stump. <laughs> Beyond Tamworth, isn't it? That part of um, New yeah, South Wales? Yeah, it's about Wales? two hours away from Tamworth, yeah. So Tamber Springs has a population, I think, of around 100. And when I was there, it was around 500. So it's a shrinking place in terms of population. And, uh, yeah, I grew up on a cattle and wheat farm there. Uh, so late 70s, uh, early 80s, and I left when I was when things would get serious. So I was about 15. The countryside there is particularly beautiful, isn't it? It's like good soil. It's real primo sort of agricultural land. Is that how it was on your place? Yeah, yeah, it was kind of... It's called volcanic ash loam. It's black, very black soil. Uh, it's the Liverpool Plains. People know it as as well. And um, it's, on, it's near the foothills of the Warren Bungles, uh, which are these uh, big sort of mountains that overlooked uh, our farm where I grew up. In fact, my mother was always very proud of the view from our toilet. Uh, you could look out the window and peek out and look at a mountain. And there was something very soothing about that, having that um, for your, you know, your, your vision to relax as you looked at the horizon <laughs> as you let go of all your issues. And to this day, I, I miss that. <laughs> you don't have that where you live? No, right no, right. I don't. No, okay. it's all very enclosed. Some kids love that kind of a environment to grow up and others find it deeply boring. What about you? Yeah, I love it and I romanticise it, to be honest. And it's not the same with um, all my uh, brothers and sisters. And also I've got a lot of friends who are comedians who grew up in the country, like Will Anderson and I are kind of opposites. He grew up on a dairy farm in Victoria in Gippsland, uh, East Gippsland, and he always talks about it like he was happy to escape, whereas I just... Everything about where I grew up was perfect. I just loved it. But I think it's because I left when I was 15 and I left sooner than I wanted to. So What was perfect about it? I remember I used to feel sorry for people in the city because they couldn't hit a golf ball in any direction when they felt like it. You know, whenever you wanted to do something, you could just go out into a paddock and just do it. But, yeah, I just remembered that just the potential to be able to do anything. But I didn't miss friends because I didn't have any and I wasn't used to having, I wasn't used to knowing a lot of people. I knew my brothers and sisters and my cousins and the few people from my school and that was that. So it was a, a close-knit family then. How many brothers and sisters were there and where were you in that pecking order time? Uh, there were two older sisters, an older brother and a younger brother. So there's five of us. Barnaby Joyce came on the program in the very early days of the show and this was when he was a Queensland senator and a backbencher. And he talked very emotionally about his childhood, which was conducted pretty much in the same time and place as you, I think, Tom, actually, in that part of the world, in New England. And he talked about his real distress about leaving the farm to go to boarding school in Sydney. He, he, it really upset him, and he even got off the train and came back home for another week or two. He said, how did you feel about going to boarding school? It was tricky. I remember I'd been... All my older brothers and sisters had gone there, so it was this great thing that was over the horizon that I'd been told, and I'd been... Um, some would say indoctrinated with uh, <laughs> believing that. But, I, I, you know, I love my parents and they told me it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. And I was going to the greatest school on earth. I went to one of those schools. But I do remember being in year six and the time coming where I was going to have to go. I remember once we had visited my brother at boarding school and we drove back. It was always a long drive home, like five or six hours. And I remember crying. My mother said what was I upset about and I was, I was like, oh, I'd worked out that I was pretty much an adult now at the age of 11, as in I could see I'm going to go to boarding school and then I'm going to be there and then I won't really be at home anymore. You know, I'll be, I'll spend the majority of the, my next six years there and then I'll graduate and then I'm gone. So you felt that you were resigning from your childhood in some ways? Almost, yeah. At that age, at 11, I'm kind of like, it's kind of done. And then I went to boarding school and had a lot of crazy fun and kind of forgot about it. 
But then halfway through the first year, my grandmother died and I had to go back to her funeral back out in Gunnada after a day. So we went, my brother and I were both at high school and, and we got on the train. We went all the back, way back to Gunnada for holidays, spent two weeks there, went all the way back to school and on the first day back got told that our grandmother had died and we had to go back again. And I remember being on the train on the way back, going through the Hunter Valley with my brother and we felt so unbelievably guilty because we were thrilled our grandmother was dead because we didn't have to go to school for a bit longer and we were sad all at the same time. And we're sitting in the dining car having like scones with cream and jam, feeling like kings when we knew all our friends were at boarding school, but we still had a funeral to go to. And so then we spent a few more days at home. So it was always a very, I had a very weird feeling back then about boarding school. I loved it and I kind of, but I knew it was, you know, not a fun time as well. In country towns where there's a fair bit of civility, a lot of that civility I've I've always found has been built around having a culture of storytelling. Was it like that with you and your family? Uh, Yeah, I mean, that's all we did for entertainment was drink and tell stories, I guess, in terms of larger context. I mean, not the kids, obviously. I always grew up hearing stories about my grandfather, uh, who was a politician, that he used to apparently stop and plant himself in the main street and start telling a story and, and a crowd would gather around him. That was the romantic notion of it. And also I always would look at my father. He was always a bit of a life of a party. I could just see like he, he, he just had this face that would light up and tell stories and people would always had to hang around him to see what was going to happen next. And also my aunts and uncles, when I'd go on holidays to the coast, you know, that was the standard thing you'd do. You'd have a barbecue and then everyone would sit around and make each other laugh or, you know, they'd play Scrabble, which was just an excuse to tell other stories and laugh. And, yeah, yeah, it was it was really valued and being funny or engaging was something that was uh, practised, I guess, but, but not on purpose. It was just our only means of entertainment. Have I got this right? Was your mum a stand-up comic at one point? Uh, yeah, it was, it was an accident. So I was on a cruise ship. This is about 10 years ago, maybe a bit longer, and there was a gong show where the passengers could get up and and just try out stand-up. And my mum and dad were on that particular cruise and my friends who were other comedians conspired against me and uh, got my mother to sign up for the gong show. (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah, that I was a judge for. That you were the judge for. Yeah, yeah. Right. And And I didn't know. She just walked on stage and I was mortified. Like, you'd think I'd be relaxed, yeah? Like, after all these years... But I was, everything fell away. All my front confidence, (laughs) reasoning, you know, (laughs) rationality. I I remember just looking at my mother walking out and I remember, you know what it was like? It was like revenge because my mother, at various times over my life, my mother, my wife, my, you know, brothers and sisters, friends and family at various points have talked about the first time they saw me on stage and have said, we were so worried for you which I took as an insult, we were just so worried for you, you know, that everything wouldn't turn out. Anyway, I, all of that came crashing down on me when I saw my mother walk out because I'm like, I know my mum, but none of these people know my mum. Oh, she's going to be full of false confidence. She's going to die on her ass. And I'm going to have to sit here and take it. And she walked out and she stood at the mic and I know how she thinks. She just took a moment. It's, it's something she's told me about where you just take a moment and a breath just to gather yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, often people, when they're good at public speaking, they'll have a moment just to, a bit of gravitas. It's a little secret trick, that one. Yeah, you yeah. just steady your second. feet. Yeah. And just... You go, hmm, mm. like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you look confident yeah. because you haven't rushed into it. But in the gap that she took, someone yelled out, get on with it, Grandma! Like, really aggressive. It wasn't you, was it? No, <laughs> no. And I was so worried for it. And she just said, up yours, mate. That quick. Up yours, mate. Got a clap. Biggest round of applause that happened all afternoon. And I'll never forget it because it was like I was impressed with how short it was, three syllables, up yours, mate. No swearing. That's very much my mother's mm-hmm. style. Yeah. Very cutting, though. And he was, and then she proceeded to just, she killed. She did really well. She won. She ended up winning the gong show. I had to obviously uh, step away from my vote. But, yeah, she ended up winning. But it was a... You recused yourself, did you? I recused myself, right. yeah, because I believe in justice. Like but... a Supreme Court justice, that, uh, <laughs> the High Court justice that finds himself hopelessly yes. entangled, uh, a conflict of interest. Well done. That's, that's yes, admirable, so I that is. stepped away. But the thrill that I got from it was I'd always thought that my dad was the funny one. I realised my mother was actually very funny, but in a different way. 
you know, she's, uh, if anything, she's probably a bit more, she wouldn't like me saying this, but she's a bit more, um, a bit more cutting and a bit more caustic, which I probably get from her. She can really, um, with one flat sentence, can really put you in your place. In terms of your comedy education, did you have that thing where you came home from school and watched the goodies on, on the ABC? Yes, or? yeah, definitely. Every, yeah, every afternoon. And how, how strongly did the goodies particularly imprint itself on your imagination? When the credits used to roll, I'd cry because it had stopped and it would be a day before I saw it again. I loved it. You, you're, I was obsessed. You're not exaggerating? No, no. I used to remember feeling really sad because the credits would roll and it would obviously be something really funny had happened too. And I'm like, oh, it's finished. Damn. And I have to wait a day. I used to love it. So I used to play goodies in the playground. Yeah. Of course, like everyone, I, I think I liked Tim Brooke Taylor and Bill Oddie the most. But looking back, I'm a, I'm a big admirer of Graham Garden because he's the guy that gets you from A to B in the plot. Like he's the yeah. guy that has the special regenerative formula that he feeds to a little kitten that becomes Kitten Kong that ter- terrorises yes. central London. Yeah, he's the far more fascinating character. Yeah, I met him once and it was, yeah, I was, I was properly starstruck meeting Graham Garden. It was very exciting. He was working on a TV show on Channel 7. There was a panel show with the Chaser crew uh, it was, uh, I think it was called The Unbelievable Truth, ran for, I think, a season. Anyway, he was consulting on that show, and to meet him in the same genre was very exciting. It sounds like you were a student, even as a kid, of comedy. Did you really... Were you one of those people that really cared about what you saw and what came to you as comedy? Yeah, I mean, I often describe starting stand-up as, like, uh, coming out of the closet as a comedian because when you look back through your life, you realise you were that all along. You know, it's like... You were so comedy many, attracted. Yeah, like I had a John Cleese poster when everyone else had a Metallica poster. You know, I, I memorised Monty Python off by heart. Um, you know, I used to listen to Bill Cosby tapes over and over again, but that was in the olden days before he'd done any crimes. Yeah, uh, or that the we'd known about anyway. Yeah, that yeah. we'd known about, yeah. yeah. It was a true crime podcast that I was listening to. I didn't realise it at the time. But, yeah, and I used to <laughs> listen and obsess over this. Stuff. I actually went to a school reunion just recently with my high school and a guy said to me, I'll never forget when we first went on school camp, you and your mate Luke were just reciting Monty Python the whole time. And my first thought was, oh, it's a bit embarrassing and, God, that must have been irritating. And he said it was just he had never heard Monty Python before, so for him it was just this hilarious couple of days as we just reeled off all our favourite sketches. Yeah, I think the thing about Monty Python and the goodies is it shows you that the imagination makes the world a playground. It makes you comfortable with paradox contradiction, yeah. juxtaposition, all those things. Yeah, and, and, and silliness. There's mm. something very silly about what I do and it's um, sometimes under the cloak of hard quiz and all that I think it gets lost a bit that I'm actually very, very silly. When you went to your boarding school, was there much of a cultural environment that allowed you to perform or do drama or music or indeed comedy of any kind? Uh, no. No. Not when I went, not no, there was none. So when I went, I remember the first thing I wanted to ask about was where the drama department was, and they said there isn't one. And I was like, oh, that's a shame. I, I really, I was really good. I thought I'll get to be in plays and do acting. I, I thought I'd do acting in plays because I like being on stage in primary school, but there was none. And then towards the end of when I was there, they started doing musicals, just like Oliver and uh, The Boyfriend and that kind of stuff, but I'm not a great singer, so... They'd audition people by whether or not you could sing, not whether or not you could perform, and then they'd dole out the really juicy speaking roles to the second and third and fourth best singer. So being a good performer, you just never got to look in. So I'd just be really overacting as a street urchin trying to get noticed. <laughs> and yeah, So that was my experience there. So for the whole of high school, it was like a, an ambition that was just, it was just simmered along. And actually, I missed a golden opportunity at the uh, reunion. It's top of my, top of mind because it was only a couple of weeks ago. Apparently, the, the woman who ran the musical was actually at our reunion. I mean, that would have been poetic, wouldn't it? To say hi, remember me. You I... passed over me. <laughs> you were you were aspiring to work in entertainment, and you saw me and saw no potential. How do you feel now? Not that that's a big deal. <laughs> not that not that that's not that I've been holding on to it. No, it's not baggage. <laughs> Actually, it's Just really, mentioned in passing, that's all. It's really good I didn't run into it. It's actually better for everyone, better for the night, better for my friends, better for her, better for the bar we're at, <laughs> <laughs> better for everyone. <laughs> Towards the end of my high school years, I, ha- I had no career ambitions. I, mm. I, I just saw the Cold War and I didn't think I was going to live to be 30. Did you have a career ambition at all? No, not really. I was at university and I was quite... Hedonistic's not the right word. I just knew if you did things you enjoyed, you'd go a bit further 
than if you struggled with something that you were making all these big sacrifices for to get through each day. It's so hard to persuade kids of the truth of that. That seems like Pollyanna-ish when I put that to my kids in the past. Yeah. Well, I was doing, I mean, I was, at, I was doing pharmacy and I thought, this is no good. I saw a, a maths paper on the ground and I thought, that looks easy. I switched to maths. Maths was easier. Uni was suddenly easier. I saw a poster. It said, uh, Five Minute Noodles Stand Up Comedy Competition hosted by MC Adam Spencer. Um, even then, he was promoting himself before anyone <laughs> knew who he was. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, Oh, I'll give that a go. Why not? And it went well, but it was, um, but yeah, I was just going, I'm, and then when I did it, it worked and I'm, I'm good at this. And I was, I was doing stand up competitions and, and surrounding me was like Craig Rucastle and Andrew Hansen from The Chaser and, and, um, you know, Andrew O'Keefe was there. He was part of that lot and, and various other performers. And a lot of them were freaking out over being on stage. And I thought, no, I, I reckon I'm okay at this. And I could see that I wasn't as panicked as them. And I thought, there's something in this. I think I might be, it might be a secret power. Did you feel comfortable on stage during oh, the first I was Keyed up, but comfortable, relaxed and excited, if you know what I mean, at the same time? It clicked. Mm. It just clicked. It felt like all those years of listening to all that stuff, all that timing and everything was just there. I just knew, I just knew when to stop talking and let that laugh happen. Some years ago, you went on that show, I think it was called Australia's Brainiest Radio Host. Is that, didn't you win it or something? Uh, it was called Australia's Brainiest Radio Star. Star. A big, <laughs> I, I, I am so sorry. I am so sorry, Tom. Australia's Brainiest Radio Star. star. And, yeah. uh, and I, I think you uh, won it. Is that right? And, yeah. And your special subject was actually quantum physics. That's yes. something you did at uni. Quantum physics. That's yeah. things at the subatomic level where the world is crazy and makes no sense, where things can have a superposition that can be in one place, uh, two places at the same time. You've already remembered more than me. Uh, uh, well, I'm sure I haven't, actually. I'm sure, I'm sure I haven't. That was the thing for you, was it? Did you, did you enjoy that aspect of physics, the kind of the crazy contradictory world of quantum physics, or am I reading too much into this, Tom? Um, no. It's, it's, it, so my university was... Uh, uh, the short story is I thought I'd be a doctor because just by default, that seemed sensible. Didn't get into it, got into pharmacy. Oh, I'll do this for a bit and then I'll work across. Realised I hated biology because I'm like, oh, biology is just finding smaller things and giving them a name and then finding <laughs> other smaller things and giving them a name. There's no process here. So I clearly was a, not a fan of the soft sciences. That, that's all biology is. Yeah, exactly, it? all that's of right. that. So then biochemistry's <laughs> out, physiology's out, pharmacology, I mean, that's even worse. But then maths... And physics, I thought I can tolerate that because you can actually get 100% in this gear if you put your mind to it. I didn't. But I just liked the idea that it was um, uh, solvable or, or you could work it out. So, yeah, so I think you're right. Do you like, like Adam Spencer, the, do you admire the kind of pristine cosmic elegance of mathematics like, like Adam does or is, that, that, is it more about getting things right? Well, Adam Spencer and I have a lot in common um, but I've, I'm sort of I'm like Adam Spencer, except uh, you can get along with me at a party. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, no. If I don't know if you if you could draw a graph, I think Adam's definitely better at maths than me. He went further. He did a PhD. I just finished a, a bachelor's degree. But yeah, that brilliance you have to trade away maybe with um, how sociable he is. <laughs> no, he's a love, I can only say this because he, he's a friend of mine. You had a band for a while called the Fantastic Leslie. I, I described it stupidly as Brock Rock, but am I that far off it? Really? Uh, you are far off, but that's that. It's because I was in another band that was prog rock, and right. then I and then I switched to this other band. So I was in another band that was very experimental. Yeah, I say that, uh, but we'll, we were repeating experiments that had already been conducted by Pink Floyd, right? <laughs> but right. we didn't know it. So, so you were avant garde, yeah, like yeah. Sonic Youth, that kind of thing, was it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. And that was that one, and I played guitar in that one, and then. Along came some friends at Sydney University and said, we need a drummer, and I was dabbling in drums. And those people at Sydney University were Andrew Hansen from The Chaser. He was a songwriter. Uh, this is before he was even thinking of comedy. And Cameron Bruce now, he's a keyboard player and uh, much more than that. I mean, he, he, he was a music director on the Elvis movie and he plays with Paul Kelly. And then um, and James Fletcher played bass and he now works for BBC World Service. And so we were... Yeah, it was a pop band. I guess it was, you know, we were, we would have idealised Ben Folds 5 or The Whitlam's. It was a piano-based pop band. One of the things that got me out of music and into comedy, I was in bands, band, lots of bands, but the whole idea of 
that punk ethos of doing it yourself, making your own fun, having this kind of democratic approach to to participating in culture. Stand up or well, comedy is so attractive because it requires so little setup. Oh. You know, you don't have to set up a drum kit, you don't have to have nineteen microphones on whatever instrument is going, you don't need to haul amps, you don't need to bump in, bump out really. It's just you and uh, and whatever it is you're doing. Was that was that part of the appeal for you? Oh, oh definitely. And also it gets back to zeros and ones because when you're in a band, you'd play, you'd rehearse, and you'd, you'd, you'd really sweat over it and you'd love it, and then you'd play a great gig where you'd played really well and, and your friends would say, oh, that was great, it's not really my cup of tea, though. People could just not like the genre and then just the whole thing falls apart, whereas comedy, they either laughed or they didn't, and I was happy with that. They either laughed or they didn't, and that was when they laughed a lot, it worked. When they didn't, it didn't. No one said, oh... I could see that you were really funny, but no laughs came out of my mouth. Like, it's just, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> no, no. our group once got a review that said we weren't as funny as we seemed to be. <laughs> just think about that for a second. Just think about that. The kind of philosophical implications of that line, I'm still yeah. sort of, it's, that's like a Zen Cohen or something like that. What are, it's almost like the critic was saying, I know I'm stupid. <laughs> I should have been understanding it. That's why I take it, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> So how did you meet your wife, Ellie? Because this was around about this time when you were at uni or thereabouts? Yeah, so we were at um, – we were we got an invitation to go and watch the Arts Review um, at uh, the Footbridge Theatre in uh, Sydney, and we were both guests of the same person, so we were seated together, and we just got to chatting, and then we went to the cast party, and at the cast party we talked to each other and no one else, and that was kind of that. How did it feel to have her come and watch you perform stand-up? Was that early on in the relationship? Yeah. So we'd been together a very short time and stand-up was brand new. I, uh, the timelines, it gets a bit hazy for me, but my recollection of it is that I invited her to the grand final of, of this competition that was hosted by Adam Spencer and uh I knew that it was going to go well because I'd been doing enough gigs that it sort of it just was kind of good. And I and I knew I, I I didn't really think about it that much. I knew she was in the crowd, but I had no hesitation in inviting her because I knew I kind of the the first time I'd done the gig at that particular bar, Manning Bar. I walked into that bar. I didn't know anybody, nobody. I'd met Adam Spencer once, and he just said, "You know, if you get a big laugh and it's three minutes in, stop." I was like, "Okay." That's all I'd met. That's Adam. That's all we had chatted about. And I, in my very first spot, I didn't know anyone. And by the end of it, I knew 15 people having a beer afterwards. And by the end of it, you know, and that's how it went for me. Every time I go to that bar, I'd come away knowing more people. So I wasn't, I was excited because it was this, there, were, there used to be like 500 people crammed into this bar at lunchtime on a Thursday. So I ended up winning and, um, yeah, and she was uh, impressed, I think. I think early on a lot of stand-ups, or well, many, many stand-ups, want to be likeable and do material that's about relatability. Mm. And was that you to begin with? Oh, yeah, kind of. I mean, I was in character for a bit. I was a bit antisocial when I first used to perform. I was a little bit like I, was, I, I really liked Norman Gunston and I liked the way that he became someone else or I was a fan of Barry Humphreys and I liked the way that but you could be the thing that you hated or, you, you know, especially mm. Barry Humphreys with a Les Patterson type character could be the things that you were making fun of. So I liked that aspect. Um, so in a way, my, my wife endured that phase. <laughs> Where I was, I would, I, I looked quite, you know, I, I deliberately dressed down and stuff on stage, and so. So you came on as a character. Didn't I you? used to, yeah. When I very, and I only did that for about a year. Once. What was the character? Uh, the character was called Malcolm. I don't know why, but that was the name. And it was, uh, I, in my mind, I was a fastidiously dressed person. I, I had a brand new flannelette shirt and brand new tracksuit pants, and brand new KT twenty six sneakers, the Velcro ones, immaculately dressed. In shit clothes. Right. So I liked, I was the kind of person I felt that you'd see on a bus and you think, what is going on with that person? And I had a terrible temper. That was that character, basically. I mean, and so I did that for a bit. And then, then once I was in a, you know, I was doing a gig out in the suburbs and I'm getting dressed in a toilet block and I thought, this is stupid. So I just walked on. <laughs> I thought, I'm not dressing up anymore. This is dumb. So I just walked on stage and, and, and then I started performing as myself. But back then, in my mind, I would have been thinking I was like Carl Barron or Jamoan. I would have been thinking I was being uh, 
relatable and and I don't like the word lovable, but yeah, trying to get the crowd to like me. Oh, okay. So you weren't so much satirising that kind of no. I, I flipped. You, weren't, you weren't being a, a kind of like doing anti bogan humour or something like that. No, you you were with that and trying to run with that. Yes, uh, right. So the character was just quite. It was it was just a chaotic character. Yeah. Whereas that yeah. So then after that, I'm like, well, I'm not doing that anymore because it's annoying. And uh, so then I just started doing yeah relatable stand up like everyone was in the nineties. I mean, Seinfeld was on TV and yeah, it's funny like the eighties there wasn't so much relatable comedy around. No. It was often confrontational instead. Yeah, well, then this the... was part of the rebellion where everyone's trying to be loved. I felt you know I felt like I remember people thinking that saying this out loud like oh. Oh, someone heckled. Like oh. I was at this pub the other day, and someone heckled. Oh, how 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 eighties? Like it was looked down upon. Like this is the nineties now, where people sit and listen. <laughs> yeah, it was a very nice right, right. period of comedy in a way. Yeah. yeah. Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. You can find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. At the end of 2006, you went over to the Middle East to entertain the troops. Where did they send you? It was Christmas time and we went to we went to Iraq, so we went to Baghdad in the middle of the green zone. Coming into that, like I've heard stories that to fly into that airport, you'd sort of circle around and then you'd have to do this very steep descent to land yes. in there. Yeah. yeah, you'd come in really steep and then you'd land. And I asked why and they said, oh, it's because if you come in really, really steep, uh, you're a smaller target for rocket attacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you find that out on the plane or uh, after you landed? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> they were always a little yeah. bit... They always tried to keep that information away from the performers, but you have to bear in mind that when I went, I was also performing with the McClymonts and their three sisters and their mother, and their youngest of the, at the time was 19. So you got to you got to somehow, you know... And then there was Alan Caswell, who's a, a, a folk performer, and he's... You know, he was a bit older, so you sort of, yeah, they'd have to pitch the information so they didn't create panic in the group. And yeah. comparing to how Baghdad looked from the sky compared to what it was like when you landed in the green zone, what was that contrast like? The green zone's just a giant US military base, essentially. That's where we landed, and it's um, it was all very, I don't know, it's kind of, because you're right in the centre of it, it was also made for the US soldiers' comfort, so there were pizza huts and... You know that kind of stuff, and there were cafes, and, and but it was also very dusty, and and but also it was quite strange. You were reminded that it was definitely an invasion, because the 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 um the Australian headquarters was inside one of Saddam Hussein's hunting palaces, uh, that had been seized, and then you'd go and look at other hunting palaces, and they'd proudly say, "Oh yeah, this is where the JDM missiles came in and just blew it, and there's a giant hole in the roof," and you're like. Oh, yeah, this was a real war. It wasn't just a TV one. It happened. And, and were you allowed to sort of go around and explore that yourself? Yeah, that's still within the green zone, right. which is all yeah. uh, locked down. But, yeah, yeah, we went and saw stuff like that. So it was like a dusty shopping mall, was it, or something, in a funny way? Yeah. it's. I mean, it's still very much a military base, so you'd see vehicles driving around. I remember you had to wear, like, um, a fluoro strip so you didn't get run over, which is um, kind of amusing because everyone wears camouflage, so... You can get run over because no one can see you. So then, but the reason you wear camouflage is so you don't get shot. So then they make you wear a high vis strip. <laughs> so it's like so you can be seen. It's like oh, when should I wear this? I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to wear the high vis beyond the wire because I'll get shot and easily found. And I don't want to be not found when I could get run over by one of my own vehicles. Very confusing. So so you've sort of got this little bit of Middle America that sort of just sort yeah. of dropped. It's like it's been brought in on a crane and sort of dropped in the middle of. Bank yeah, bank. lots of like demountable type buildings and everything's all temporary and just dropped in and all the windows are sandbagged because you know there's still a chance of. Um, rockets coming in and, yeah, yeah, it was a very strange time. And were you given, like, rules on content before you could perform in front of the troops? Oh, the d- defence was very proud of the fact that they we could say whatever we wanted. Uh, they used to just say the concerns are only about uh, security or safety issues in terms of, you know, so when you called home you couldn't give away where you were, for example. So just more security issues. But other than that, they were quite proud of the fact that we want you to say whatever you want because you're here to entertain the Australian troops and they want the full treatment. 
and then they would say, but the caveat was, but every now and then we might go and be guests and entertain at a US area, but they have, you can't make fun of the president, religion's off limits because a lot of them are Christian and don't swear, you know, all this kind of... Wow, the land weirdness. of the First Amendment. Yes, yeah, but funnily enough, the Australia, you could go for it. In fact, they would say, oh, I make fun of John Howard because he was Prime Minister at the time. They love that stuff. So, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of egged on to some degree to kind of, you know, lift it up a notch. Normally when you do stand-up, you'd be in a room full of people who've been living around the same area, living in suburbia, watching the same TV as you. Was it difficult to do observational humour in front of a bunch of soldiers who've been in Baghdad for a year or so? In some respects, I, I, I was going to do my regular stand-up set, but then I thought it just doesn't add up to me how this is going to be good. Because I'd think about my material... I can't even remember what I was doing at the time, but you just think, oh, yeah, oh, am I going to do a joke about that ad on television? They haven't probably haven't seen it for a year. You know, you just sort of think that's dumb. And then I'd be walking along duck boards through mud to a, you know, to a part of the camp that's underwater and, and I go, this is, this is shit out. And then someone will say, oh, yeah, you know why it's shit? It's because of the Dutch. They came in here and they... they pulled out all the drainage that we'd put in. And then, oh, bloody hell. And how do, how do I get to the Dutch part of the camp? You go through there and some guy would be saying, yeah, and look at them over there. They can frat, not us. Look, all the women, they're out in their sunbite. And then you're like, well, this is gold. And so then you're like, oh, I was in the Dutch base. It's mud. They're all rooting. Yeah, you're just like, you know, <laughs> they can do whatever they want. It's a low-lying country. They're used to being underwater. You know, and off you go and you start to realise all you had to do was look. You know, and to some degree to look around and not notice any of it would have been weirder. So, yeah, so you get on base and you're doing a show and they and, and you, someone tells you, oh, look, there's um, where we're performing, you know, it, it's Tarankow, it's up in the mountains in Afghanistan and, um, and we have to turn all the lights off at night because we don't want to be a target for rocket attacks. There's little red LEDs uh, so you can find your way around and you won't trip over, but we can't have any lights on here. We're going to full blackout at night and then you do the gig and there's one light on your head. You're like, hang on, is this the only light on in the whole camp? You know, and you're pointing it out. <laughs> is that I get a missile in my face? And then it's funny because, you you know, you're talking, you're together, you know. And they would have loved it. I, yeah. I, that would have been an amazingly intense response. Yeah. I just wondered that it, once when my group was touring around Ireland, um, you know, we were really happy to be in Ireland for the first time and loving it and, you know, saying nice things on stage and they were pretty indifferent to that. Then by the end of the tour, we, we just, we'd had enough of touring in Ireland and Tim got on stage and said things like, Ireland, tourist rip-off, and just just got stuck into Dublin, got stuck into Ireland, and they loved it. They yes. really loved it then. I, I'm wondering if you had a similar ex kind of epiphany about while you were doing those shows in the Middle East about the kind of material you can present to an audience. Well, yeah, I was kind of all built up from it because I was like, oh, I can do anything. Because my retreat position on stage when I was in the Middle East was always if things got hairy, I'd just say, oh, what are you going to do, fire me? Oh, you're going to send me back to Australia. What a shame. I don't get to hang out with you in this shit hole. <laughs> oh, oh, what punishment. And once you've got a retreat position like that, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. And then I was like, well, how do I, how do I get that, that energy back in Australia? And I thought, well, you've got defence and that structure and the authority and then you go back home and you've got TV networks and all of that and the comedy industry and the way things are supposed to be done. And you're like, ah, oh, what if I went on a panel show like Good News Week and I said I didn't like MasterChef and I say they should pull it off the air and I don't care what you say. You can fire me from this show. Good News Week doesn't pay me properly anyway. And suddenly it's all clicked into gear and that's probably led me to where I am now. I thought, oh, you can actually say anything if you're prepared to meet the consequences. And once I decided I didn't mind being fired, it's all open. It's all gravy in all different directions. I'm just impressed by what a correct assessment that is of where the power really lays, which is the audience. It's the audience. It's, it's not so the powers obvious. that be. You're not trying to endear yourself to an executive producer. You're not trying to get a solo special out of this. You're, you're talking right over their heads Yeah. to the audience. Yeah, well, I can remember a time when I would do the comedy festival gala and you'd be asked to submit a script and... They wouldn't really, it's, it's more, they would always say, this is just for camera rehearsal so everyone knows where everyone is and everyone knows what everyone's doing. And then just be a minor suggestion. Do you really have to say that? And it might, you know, it just be, but even just the act of submitting the script, for me, I, I was offended by. Because as soon as you submit the script, 
you're giving someone the chance to say, maybe don't say that, and you're giving them a square and they're getting sandpaper and they're just filing off the corners a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it's just a bit easier to swallow, but then it's not as, you know, noticeable. And so for me, I just, yeah, I thought, oh, you just got to communicate directly with the audience and that, that's the way it should be. It just said, but, but you have to be prepared uh, for, for people getting cross or editing you out of shows or whatever. When you were performing in Afghanistan, tell me how you got to meet members of the Australian SAS. Well, I'd done a show in, uh, just trying to think, it was a secret at the time. It's not anymore. Oh, that's right, we're all gone. It was Afghanistan. But in the book I wrote about it, it was a, it was a secret base. But, yeah, it was in a base. I'd done the show and it had been fun and just one of them walked up to me with all sort of cloaked in a blanket, had a beard, and said, hey, uh, uh, do you want to go and have a beer? And I'm like, uh, who are you? Uh, um, uh, 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 I guess we're special forces. I'm like, uh, okay. I guess we're special yeah. forces. <laughs> and oh, it was God. just very... I don't know. I was like, okay, um, yeah. And so me and some of the uh, and and the McClymont sisters, who I mentioned before, they we went back and sat around and they they ran things by their own rules. I think that's been established. That's become very clear in in recent years. Yes. <laughs> yes, but I have to point out that this is before the terms of reference of that inquiry. And um, and yeah, we sat around playing uh, poker and having beers, and it was it was a thrill. Playing poker with SAS men. Yeah. Do, do, are they good losers if they indeed they do lose? Oh, hopeless. Like, like You'd hopeless think players be, or hopeless losers? Hopeless players. You'd think they'd be really good, but they weren't. <laughs> some of them didn't know how to play. I explained to some, some of them how to play Texas Hold'em, yeah. Hang, hang on. Because you picture the SAS sitting yeah. around, they've got like a toothpick out of them out playing cards. No, because they, no, they're probably too busy out actually doing de- you know defence stuff. Aren't they supposed to have like, like brilliant psych out? Abilities where they can sort of you know interrogate someone and read them and make them think what they want to think and they they that just didn't work on you or didn't didn't work at all they couldn't oh, do that at a poker table oh, I guess they kind of didn't care maybe they were pretending to be bad at poker and that was their cover and they they, they wanted to lure me into thinking they were bad at playing poker and but that guy had said oh, special forces I guess <laughs> hadn't he so no well they were they're an impressive group of of men yeah they were they were extraordinary they all had beards. They because uh, they didn't have to follow the same rules as the standard army, and they they were um, they were out on long long range operations, and they were telling us all kinds of hair raising stories of their of their adventures. How are Australians when you meet them in the street? I say, I ask this because I know so many stories about Australians will do all kinds of terrible things to really take you down a peg during comedy. <laughs> Wendy Harmon told me a story about how she was followed around Pran Markets once in Melbourne by. An elderly woman who followed her from stall to stall, making her feel increasingly self-conscious as the morning wore on. And finally, she was right behind Wendy. And Wendy said, can I help you with something? And she said, I think you're vulgar. <laughs> and she spent all that time yeah. following Wendy around just to tell her that. That's extraordinary. But Australians will cross the street to tell you they don't think much of your show. And, and nowhere else is like that in the world, I don't think. Like Britain, British people are nice. Oh. The British people want to keep their dignity and they want to, you to keep your dignity in any kind of social yes. interaction. Do you have that experience? Not, not really, not exactly, because I think people are scared of me a little bit. And um, the experience I get all the time is someone will say to me, uh, oh, g'day, how are you? And I'm, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm well, thanks. And they'll be like, oh, oh, I guess you think you're pretty good being on TV or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm above average, I guess you could say, and I just play into it. And then after a while they get a bit flustered and I realise, oh, hang on, they're doing me to me. They're trying to insult me. <laughs> So, and I don't read it because I don't know them. So if they're being sarcastic out of the blue, I'm like, what? Kids do it. Teenagers do it too, which is really baffling. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a so-called comedian apparently. I'm like, gee, that's a bit much. They're like, oh, I'm just joking. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. You're, you're doing me to me. Now I get it. But I do get weird ones. The weird, the, the biggest insult I get, which, which is amazing, and I can't, <laughs> I thought you could outgrow it, and this is where I'm stupid, is that, I still, I reckon it was, it's only weeks have passed since someone said to me, and what else do you do? Only weeks. Like, what more do you have to do? Like, I've won a gold Logie. Like, I'm on the, one of the highest rating shows on television. I help co-create it. Yeah, but, like, but, but you, must, you must be doing something else. Like, I, I tell younger comedians that just to let them know you cannot outrun it. I stupidly thought the gold Logie in the back of my mind, I thought, that's it, that's that done. Nah, still... What else do you do? They reckon you're working in a pharmacy during the day. I don't know. Like you, you put they on will, the white coat and that, you sell, like, prescription drugs and then you, 
and then you put aside the white lab coat and you, you get off down the, off that perch and get onto another perch yes. and uh, tell jokes. Well, they, the weird thing is they will have talked about how much they love hard quiz for, at length and then at the end go, and what else do you do? And they don't even realise it's an insult. So they make pretend insults I don't get and then they do that and then that's an actual insult. What else do you do to tide yourself over between episodes? <laughs> oh, your hard quiz is on at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night. And on the other days, yeah, I work at a pharmacy <laughs> in Romsey in country Victoria and I dispense um, drugs, keeps which you, is an important job. An important job. Yeah. Keeps you grounded too. Yeah. Keeps you relatable. Yeah. Keeps you likeable. It okay. does. It does. You've got two kids. Yes. Do they like what you do or are they a bit embarrassed by it? Because my, my daughter came home from school one day and said to me, oh, Dad, when are you going to give up your stupid radio show? And I said, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? She says, oh, my teachers like it. And they tell me, I'm like, eh, eh, eh. She's making the kind of gagging yeah. gesture with her finger. Do you, are kids em, embarrassed, pleased, and or both at the same time by what you do? Uh, h- how old's your daughter? Oh, back then she would have been all of nine, I think. Yeah, I think my daughter might be about to turn. She's ten. And my son's seven. He's quite enamoured by it all. Uh, my son, he has, he loves it. He's like, he has a blazer that he wears, a little blazer, and he calls that his comedy jacket. And he calls shirts with collars comedy shirts. Because whenever I'm going out to do a gig, I will have ironed a shirt with a collar to do a gig. So they're comedy shirts. So often he'll put on his comedy shirt and his comedy jacket if he wants to go out and look fancy. So he loves it. And um, he he even, <laughs> I just remember, he took a, I keep lanyards. I'm not sure if you do. I always put them over a hook from whatever things I've been at. And there's a giant pile. So I get back from the Logies. I've got a AAA backstage uh, Logie pass from when it was on at the Gold Coast. And he, he takes it to show and tell in a country Victorian town. Oh, yeah, this is my dad's triple A pass to the Logies. First question would have been, what are the Logies? <laughs> but he loves it. In yeah. fact, he, like, he, he will get the gold Logie and him and his friends, they, will play, they actually played an awards night as a game. But because they didn't know what the Logies were, they played. They were playing a game of the Grammys, an awards night that they've actually heard of, and they were pretending that the Gold Logie was a Grammy so that they could actually have fun. <laughs> so he loves it. My daughter, she loves it too. They'll watch me backstage sometimes. We watch Hard Quiz together, which can be weird. Um, but she, uh, I feel that she's probably on the cusp of it just being a bit, bit daggy. I get the sense from hearing you in other interviews, that you really enjoy fatherhood. Were you surprised by how enjoyable fatherhood is? Well, yeah, because my wife and I, sounds horrible looking back on it, I think we put it off for a really long time as an inconvenience, which I think is probably a little bit, in my mind, it's a bit of a um, downside of, of the Western world. I think that we've everything's taught us that, you know, you, you know you, it's going to cost more, it's going to be miserable, uh, it's going to be difficult, and so you put it off for as long as possible. In fact, if if I'm really honest, I was almost pressuring my wife into it because I was saying I'm kind of running out of life, <laughs> as in I'm not going to meet my grandchildren. You know, the, the generations are getting too far apart here. How, how old were you when you became a father? Uh, late 30s. So, yeah, so late. I mean, I went to my school reunion. Everyone in there had they're all, all of their kids were finishing high school and at uni, and there was me and just a few others with yeah, smaller ones. But we don't do that as men, do we? We don't stand around in a group and say, isn't it great having kids? We, don't, we sort of do this fake bitching and moaning, which none of us really mean. It's funny, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I, I, do remember, I do remember specifically a friend of mine, Paul Collegia, who was one of the, he was the head writer on the Skit House, a sketch show I did years ago. He had young kids back then, that's like 20 years ago, and he was always adamant that it was a joy. And he refused to tell any story about things being difficult. He just didn't buy into it. And I always remember that. He used to talk it up. And I've copied him. And I so whenever people ask me about it, I kind of refuse. I don't like telling stories about the inconvenience. First of all, those stories have been told a million times. I think it's more interesting to tell those moments of joy. I think we tell those stories because we're embarrassed by how unsettled we are by the love, you know, the, the love that comes to you. I think, yeah. I think that's, that's a way of dealing with those unsettled feelings. Yeah, and also dis- whinging is easier to do. It's, mm. a, it's a very na- it, it comes out very easily, whereas to describe genuine joy is, is, is quite difficult to explain because you get to the end of a story about something being really good and everyone goes, oh, 
<laughs> yes, that's the time. I'm, I'm, I think I need to go to the toilet now or something like that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're yeah. not even necessarily embarrassed. It's just like, well, what do I say to that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty boring too, I suppose, isn't it, if you bang on about it, what a marvellous time you're having. No one's, yeah. no one's really happy for you. I guess so. Uh, I think I was like that before. I had kids myself too, hearing those stories. Mm. Touring life. Do you have to tour much? And is that offset by being able to be home much more when you are at home? Yeah, well, things have completely changed in the last five years for me. I used to be away all the time, and now when I go to the airport, it always feels like I haven't been there for ages, which is nice. Um, And also uh, the venues got bigger, and the joy of that is that the number of shows got less. So it wasn't that long ago I'd go to the Adelaide Fringe, I'd be there for five weeks, and I'd take the whole family with me and would spend five weeks there, and it was fantastic. Whereas now I'll go to Darwin for two nights and just and so I just drop into places and do shorter runs. So I still really enjoy touring, but it's not nearly as uh, arduous as it used to be. Did you mind not performing during COVID? Uh, I was really looking forward to it. When so it not ha- performing, you mean? Yeah, yeah, because in that year I'd actually planned to... We, we'd made this big plan to go on a European holiday for three months. It was, it was in the works for a while. So I'd already planned to take what I was going to call long service leave. And um, and so then it happened and it was like, oh, well, I was going to do nothing anyway. So that's so I wasn't too annoyed by it. Um, but what happened was for a long time I'd fantasised about retiring early just as a reaction to my dad. My dad used to always say, I'm going to work until I drop dead. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to retire at 40. What do you think of that? Anyway, so I always had this in my head that I'd maybe quit comedy at 50 and then suddenly be finished. But, yeah, that, that long absence of performing put paid to that because I learnt uh, how strange it is to live in a time when there's nothing on the horizon. So I had about, I reckon I, for a good six months, I had nothing in my diary at all. Did you feel it, out of sorts? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I didn't think I would. I thought I'd be really cool with it. I, uh, My family at the time, we we cashed in all our chips on our Italian trip that didn't happen and instead we went to Byron Bay. So we spent an extended time there which sounds perfect, you, you, you do whatever you want, had all the days free. And then after a while I'm like, this feels really weird. I think I might need a purpose. And that's what I learnt from my big gap, that I think you actually need to be needed. It's such an obvious thing, but I didn't know that. I thought I could just read books and swim and play PlayStation and go to nice restaurants and drink too much and everything would be great. And it was until it wasn't because I just thought, oh, I think I need to be useful. Yeah. To me it was really stark because, like I said, on paper everything's fine and then there was a moment where I was reading news.com.au and it said Anastasia Palaszczuk has announced you can have 50% capacity in a theatre and I rang my management straight away and said it's on. I can do a show in Brisbane, Queensland, I'm in Byron, we can just start a tour. And as soon as we locked some dates in, I just felt normal again because I had just had something to look forward to on the horizon. I'm like, oh, now I can enjoy myself. Was there a sense of relief? It wasn't relief. It was just that I felt like this is the way life should be. There should be things over the horizon you look forward to. You can't just coast through life just like you're on a conveyor belt, just cruising along. There needs to be something that it's, you know, I, I, I realise my whole life you're always planning things, I'm, and then I'll do this and then I'll do that, and, and that's, that is life. Whereas when, when, you just, when you've only got leisure... And no actual aim. It's it's weirdly enough. I I've heard retirees talk about it, and I never understood it. And now I'm a 48 year old man that knows exactly what retirees are talking about when they say you need something to do. Yeah, have you rethought that then? Yeah, yeah, I have definitely. And and my wife said, and it's true. She said, so long as you had a gig at an RSL somewhere, you'd be happy as Larry. And I'm, and she's absolutely right. As, if I knew. But in two weeks' time, I was going to be at Mackay RSL and I had to think about what I was going to do when I got there. There you go. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm as happy as I can be. As a comedian, you can adopt a cantankerous persona in your 60s and 70s. It's enormously <laughs> entertaining, as your mum discovered. Yes. As your mum discovered. So, so there is that, isn't there? You can look forward to that. Some people really hit their hit perfection. Yeah. Like I'm thinking Jerry Stiller here in, in Seinfeld, who plays George yes. Costanza's dad. Who, this, the funniest thing he ever did was when he was in his 70s. Oh, man. I will one day be, yeah, someone's dad in a sitcom and I'll nail it. (laughs) It's been such a joy speaking with you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. 
For more conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.